Yeah. Have a good day, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Have a good day. It's so quiet all of a sudden. Yeah. It is. During, during this break, I'm, I'm curious, has anybody heard from Buddy and Shelly New? I'll take that as a no. No, I haven't, Doug. I was wondering about, uh, about them, too. Yeah, I mean, they were, they were Shelly in particular was a, was a regular at Morning Minion, and I don't think we've seen them since this all started. Well, she finished Kaddish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but she was still coming. I yep. think they may have another synagogue they, uh, they visit. Yeah, they also go to Adath Israel. Right. Her brothers belong there. Right. Okay, we ready? Okay, mm -hmm. now, uh, can everybody see the summary of the Book of Ruth? Yeah. 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 Okay. <clears throat> um, this week, Doug, I didn't uh, forget about your request. I was going to do it next week. Um, do you remember what you requested? Absolutely not. <laughs> you asked about the, the um, halacha of transplants. Mm. You know. Okay. So I need to get, get about that, and I'd love to do it, um, but we'll do it next week, because I came across this about the, uh, some stuff about the Book of Ruth, and <coughs> excuse me. I, you know, and this week it's the time to do it. So I want to start first with this just um, real brief summary. You can see how uh, um, how it, it divides up real easy. It's in four chapters. Um, by the way, if you uh, need this, I found this on Wikipedia, but it's neither here nor there. All right, so we have four chapters. The um, it calls the prologue, Ruth meets Boaz. You know, then Naomi sends Ruth to Boaz to, Bo to Boaz's threshing floor, and then the resolution and epilogue. Um, so, with that, just as a you know overall, I, I, here is the actual text. And I want to just go through a couple of things about the text of uh, the Book of Ruth. The, the Book of Ruth can be looked at in, in many different ways. Um, like, like many you know, literary books. And by the way, I think some of, some of you were at the discussion with uh, Shim Maslin last week where we talked about uh, who wrote, and basically, in some ways, who wrote the Bible and other things. Um, and I guess before we begin, we could actually sit and, and uh, argue whether this really happened or whether it's a, uh, uh, you know, just a literary work. You know, uh, um, I don't know how. The, I just pulled it. Yeah, and the, fact, the fact is, is that in the Tanakh, we put the book of Ruth in the Ketuvim, you know, which is the, which we call the section on writings, uh, which in the uh, hierarchy of Kedusha, that's got the, uh, you know, I'll say the least in the sense that it is uh, not meant to be considered either part of the halachic sections or the prophetic ones. 
Um, and I really I'm not going to get. We won't have to get into when it was written or how it was written, but I, I think we can keep that in the back of our minds that this is probably. Uh, we don't necessarily have to think that this is actual historic documents, although the Christian Bible does view it as historic. And you know, when you look through the order of books in the Christian Bible, um, Ruth is usually put between. What is it, Judges and Samuel? Um, okay, yeah, I think it's between Judges and Samuel. All right. So we generally look at the book of Ruth, you know, and consider that there's several themes that run through it uh, and that these we feel are, are good, important characteristics, uh, make it appropriate for the festival of Shavuot or for any other time. We have the trait of kindness that characterizes um, the three heroes of, uh, of, uh, of the story, Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. Um, we have the um, status of converts in Judaism. Uh, we'll get to a little bit more of that later. And then the Davidic dynasty, how ultimately the offspring of Ruth and Boaz leads to the direct ascendancy of the house of David. Okay. Um, so the other, the other thing that we have about Ruth is that there are several ways that we have of reading it several ways of interpreting it. Um, and I think from the outset, I'll say that they're all right. And the interpretations that we may give it today may be the same or different than others, um, but they're legitimate interpretations, okay? And what I wanna focus on, whoops, wrong one, um, is we're gonna look at the central role that women pay, play throughout this book. Um, and it's in many ways uh, quite unique. All right. Um, there are um, two women, of course, uh, who, are, uh, who are central, a third one, uh, at the beginning is also, you know, plays a key role, but we'll get to that. Um, and I should also say that there are, in the whole canon of the Tanakh, there are only two books that are named after women, uh, Ruth and the Book of Esther. Um, this, you know, really shows how in each of them, the, uh, the two women share the central, you know, role in the book. You know, we could say that there are the uh, heroines. Um, wait, I skip something here. Hold on one second. All right. The book starts in a way that's very typical of many books in the Tanakh. Uh, by talking about a man, right? And it says, in the days when the chieftain ruled, there was a family of land, and a man of Bethlehem and his Judah, with his wife and his two sons, went to reside in the country of Moab. So here we have the book named after Ruth, going to be talking about Ruth, but yet it starts with Elimelech. Oh yeah, his wife, by the way, his wife's name is Naomi. And uh, he's got two boys, one named Machlon and Chilion. Um, and they, uh, they, they went to, um, to Moab. And the two sons married Moabite women, Ophrah and Ruth. Okay, so here we have the start. You know, kind of the focus starts on, on these two three men, but their central role is not going to last very long. 
because in verse five, then, uh, wait, hold on a second. Uh, well, I, I actually didn't last long because in verse three, uh, Elimelech dies. And then in verse five, Machlon and, and, and Kilion die. Kilion. Um, so, so much for the, uh, the starring role these men will play. So we're left with Ruth, Oprah, Oprah, or, not Oprah, she's on TV, Orpah and Ruth, okay? Um, and, and Ruth at this point decides that um, she has to uh, head back to, to Moab and she approaches the two daughters-in-law and say, yeah, we got to go. Now, at this point in the book, it's, it's apparent that the two daughters-in-law have equal status um, in the sense that <coughs> it just says she's accompanied by the two daughters-in-law. Um, one is not, as opposed to other stories in the, uh, in the Torah, one is not more beloved than the other, uh, nor is one seen in any way different than the other. Um, and and uh, and both of them also insist that they're going. I want to move this one. Uh, that they're going to uh, go with her back to the land of Canaan. And they're both equally intent. Naomi then describes the bleak, fleet, uh, the bleak future that um, that they're going to have. Um, and, you know, and she said, "Hey, you know, it's not going to be so great. You want to come with me? Just be aware that uh, life is not so good there." It, you know, so you may want to consider staying here. Um, at which point, Orpa says, okay, I'm gone. And she leaves and heads back to her family. Um, the, uh, Ruth, on the other hand, um, well, before I get to that, verse 8, Naomi said to his two daughters-in-law, turn back each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with, with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant each of you each of you find security in the house of a husband. And she kissed them farewell. And then um, or, or if I kissed her mother-in-law farewell, but Ruth clung to her. Now, this phrase here at the end, Ruth clung to her, um, is a uh, an interesting, you know, word. Um, you know, in, in the context here, you know, we see Orpah, Orpah left, but it's also important to note that even though Orpah left, the book of Ruth portrays her in a very positive light. This is not a, uh, she's not doing wrong by leaving. As a matter of fact, if we take, you know, Naomi's sentiment, it's actually right that she left. She said, leave, I got nothing for you. You know, and Orpah says, okay, I'll agree with you. But and, Orpah, Orpah becomes the ancestor of Amalek. Okay, um, but still in this situation, the neither the commentators nor any of the uh, other rabbis view her as doing something that was ill-advised or inappropriate. Even though Amalek comes later, hey, you know, we can't control our children. What can I tell you, right? Um, I I would uh, I would go, you know, unless time you want to make more of it. Yeah. 
No, okay. No, that's all right. I just I just learned that like a, a couple months ago. So. Uh. All right. No, I mean it's a good point, but I think in the context of what Ruth is is saying here, that um, the uh, in the context of what we have here in the story of Ruth and Naomi, uh, Orpah's leaving uh, is not considered uh, that uh, terrible and she still um, maintains a very positive image in how she, uh, how she, her position in regards to the family, how she treats uh, Naomi and uh, her relationship with Ruth. Not that much is said, but definitely not anything negative. Okay. All right. Um, so what happens from now on is we see the special bond that develops between Naomi and Ruth. Um, it starts off very famously as uh, Ruth said to her, okay, your sister-in-law is gone, um, go follow her. And Ruth says, do not urge me to leave you, to turn back and not follow you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Uh, where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. Thus and many more may the Lord do to me if anything but death parts me from you. And be thankful I didn't sing that. You know, there's so many melodies to that. Uh, and we'll just, you know, uh, take her words without the melody. Um, but, you know, here we see, you know, the, the famous, famous line, probably the most famous line of the book. Uh, how Ruth not only casts her lot with Naomi, but indicates, you know, and we take this as the original, you know, uh, conversion in the sense uh, your God is my God, etc. Um, and Ruth shows her determination. Uh, and even says the next one, she Naomi saw how determined she was, but shows her determination to stick with Naomi to be a part of her people and to go on with her. Um, okay, the that phrase here, but Ruth clung to her, is actually uh, becomes an allusion to a verse in in Bereshit. Anybody uh, off the top got any ideas on that one? Okay, that's it. The in Bereshit it says, um, "A man leaves his mother, his father and mother, and clings to his wife." Um, it uses the same the same word, uh, and. I'm sure this uh, ver this uh, verb is used other places in the Torah offhand. I, I don't know of any, but certainly this uh, one that we talk about all the time about how, um, you know, how many times have you heard it as a, in, in a marriage ceremony? Um, but it's one that, uh, you know, has a special significance. It's just not two people um, being together, but they're, you know, they're clinging to one another. They're really, um, I, I guess you could say intertwined and, and, and you know, um, anything, any other word that can go along with that uh, parallel. Okay. Um, the here we have to point out, though, that we're not talking about a man clinging to a woman. Um, we have 
you know, uh, and especially they're not leaving the house of their father and mother. Um, oh my God, I take that back, I read that wrong. A woman who does leave her father and mother and she clings not to her spouse, but to her mother-in-law. Um, and the relationship is not one of uh, matrimony, but of sisterhood and loyalty between the two women, one to another. The um, solid, this idea of solidarity between women is not really that, uh, it's not self-evident throughout the Tanakh. Uh, we do have it in a couple of places. Um, first of all, in the story of the two midwives in the beginning of Shemot, where Pharaoh tells the, uh, says that the, the sons of the uh, Israelites should be, uh, should, be, uh, should be killed. And the uh, two midwives go against that order. And, oh, wait a minute. Um, I had the names of the two, those two women and they just slipped my mind. Um, any event. All right, so we, we know there's the, the two midwives uh, in Shemot. And then right after that, it's three women who act together to save the, uh, the infant uh, Moses as he comes out of the Nile. His mother, his sister, and Pharaoh's daughter take him from the basket in the Nile and, and raise him. Um, it is also the, in the Song of Deborah, in which Deborah praises Yael and, and blesses her, although in a prose narrative. Um, the other, there are other instances in scripture where there's a meeting of two women in the story, but it is usually loaded with feelings of jealousy and hatred and hostility and most often competition you know, such as uh, Sarah and, ha and Hagar and Leah and Rachel, okay? So the relationship in, uh, in the book of Ruth is completely different. Let me just read you a note that was written by a, in a commentary by a woman named Ilana Pardes. Ruth's clinging to Naomi makes clear that rival is not necessar rivalry is not necessarily a predominant feature in relations between women, even in types of relation which are particularly prone to conflict. We are not dealing here with two co-wives, but the relationship of a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law is, in psychoanalytic terms, similar. The mother, after all, is the son's ob first object of love. Thus, even when a son marries an outside object, the drama is not over. What this means for the women involved is a delicate situation in which they must share the same man. The relationship of the mother-in-law and daughter-in-law, as a result, may be tem painfully tense, as, all is, as is too well known. The mother, abandoned by her son, is likely to be hostile toward the young woman who has replaced her, while the daughter-in-law may try to ensure her position in her husband's heart by challenging the influence of her, of her precursor. Okay. Um, getting all the wrong things that went on. Okay, any questions or comments up until now? Okay, um, all right. So Ruth and Naomi continue to go to, uh, and, you know, back, back home and uh, when they get there, of course, they've got nothing. 
And you know, there is the, what am I looking for? Um, there is the tradition that when we harvest wheat and other grains, if anything falls, it has to be left for the gleamers, the people that follow, to pick up whatever is left behind. The ones that are doing the harvesting cannot uh, go back and pick it up. Um, and Ruth is now following behind those who are uh, harvesting in the field of Boaz. Um, Boaz takes note of her and, and says, um, you know, and, and I missed that line. I thought I had bolded it. No. Um, Boaz says to Ruth, listen to me, daughter. I'm in verse 8. Don't go glean in another field. Don't go elsewhere. But stay here close to my girls. And, you know, you stay here. Take, I'll make sure that you're well taken care of and you won't have to worry about anything. And Ruth does so. So Naomi also says when she hears this, um, You know, uh, reassures Neo, uh, Ruth that she is doing the same thing. And if we then take a story which now has a triangle of two women and one man, usually we get a situation where there's jealousy, hostility, but not here again. Um, the it's not going to be two women fighting over a man. On the contrary, Naomi encourages Ruth, you know, stay, stay in the field of Boaz, do it as he says, and Ruth in turn is fully compliant with what her mother says. And after all, they, at least Naomi realizes that Boaz is actually the, uh, what we call the Goel, uh, the Redeemer. He is the only direct living descendant uh, in her family or in the family of uh, Elimelech. And it would then be up to him. But oh, wait a minute, he's not. There was one before him, right? Uh, it could be up to him to be the one um, who has to marry uh, Ruth and have a son and um, name it after the father. Wait, did I mix up Seth here? Um, hold on one second. Uh, yeah, okay, here on what I have here in verse 7, he says, this is for me done in cases of redemption or exchange to validate my trends. Um, anyway, he goes, there's actually another relative. Boaz goes to him and performs the ceremony of Chalitza, which is where uh, uh, the man has to take off his shoe and, you know, thus pass off the duty of redemption to Boaz, uh, which in turn uh, he does. And we then get to uh, the, uh, Ruth going with, uh, with Boaz. Um, I want to look for a moment here now. On, if we take the story of Ruth and compare it to the story of Abraham. All right. We have certain parallels here that are not, we, we don't always look at, uh, but yet uh, come to play when we look at it. You know, God tells Abraham, go forth from your neighbors, from your native land and from your father's house to the land and I will, that I will show you. You know, we're all from, I'm sure we're all familiar with this sentence, right? You know, lech lecha, me'artzacha, me'maladatecha, etc. Um, 
And if we look at the book of Ruth, um, it says, you, you came from a people you had not known before. You know, go, go forth. You, parallel to you came from people not known before, where it says to Abraham, from your native land. Here it says, from the land of your birth. Um, Abraham, from your father's house. Um, in, in Ruth, it says, you left the house of your father and mother. Um, to the land that I will show you, you know, and here it is, and you came to a people you had not known before. Um, so there's a lot of similarity of language uh, and in the content, but of course we have a couple fundamental differences. Um, one is, one is a commandment from God. The other is Ruth does it completely on her own. Um, God, um, God promised Abraham a brilliant future. If, you know, if he leaves, he's going to, his descendants will, what does it say, will be like the sands of the earth. Um, Naomi is told, hey, you come with me, it's going to be bleak. It's not going to be so hot. Well, she did it anyway. Um, Abraham does what he does as an act of faith, but in, in Ruth, we see it here, it's, yes, it's an act of faith, but it's really showing us what devotion and love can do, that she's really very devoted to Naomi and uh, will go with her. Um, So the references and the parallels to the patriarchs uh, and matriarchs throughout the, uh, the Tanakh, it, it's, it's, it's done often time, but it's usually in the context of showing how what is being talked about in that particular passage is really the context continuity of what God promised Abraham, you know, when he got them to, to leave. The book of Ruth then is the only case in the Tanakh where the matriarchs are called up from the past to serve as the model for the future building of the house of Israel. Because here, you know, ultimately at the end of the book, we see that it's um, what Ruth and Boaz do is leading to the uh, the house of David and the uh, the hope that many people have of the or the build up of the people and the coming of the Messiah. Okay, uh, more yeah. Um, just uh, uh, I've been following along in the uh, in the Robert Alter translation. And he has a comment on the same point that I think just expands on what you said. Um, if I could share it for a minute. Go ahead, please. Uh, you, you left your mother and your father in the land of your birth. These words are the most significant literary allusion in the book. They explicitly echo God's first words to Abraham in Genesis. Go forth from your land and your birthplace and your father's house. Now it is a woman and a Moabite who reenacts Abraham's long trek from the east to Canaan. She will become a founding mother of the nation as he was the founding father. Ruth's paradoxical journey outward from the home, from home that proves to be a going back to home has aptly been summarized by Herbert Marx. These brief chapters outline the two principal archetypes of Western narrative, the Abrahamic myth of definitive rupture and the Odyssean myth of ultimate return, the journey's home. Very good, very good, Doug, thank you very much. Sure. Okay. Um, any other uh, comments or questions about this? I uh, 
he just thought that would be a nice thing to do before she grew out. Um, and a uh, nice way to begin this week. That's very fascinating. Thank you. It, it really yeah. was. Yes, yes. Oh, no, thank uh, you. Thanks for doing that. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So, just want to, you know, yesterday, Carmi and I uh, participated in that national remood session. You know, five hours. Wow. Uh, what was it? I don't yeah, know. You know what remood is? Oh, yes, remood. Yeah. Okay. So, they, they had a session yesterday, it started at 12. Um, and last session ended at five. And oh. since several of the presenters were people we know and haven't seen in a while, well, we stuck around. And, uh, and, and then I just read the article from yesterday's paper about how you can get Zoom fatigue. Yes. That was yesterday. <laughs> so, and actually, um, we do have another Zoom meeting coming up at 11. <laughs> what can I say? Anyway. Um, next week, uh, you know, like I promised Doug, uh, and uh, I got two reasons. Uh, one, because I said to Doug, and I'm coming up on the anniversary of, um, of my surgery. Uh, so I think, you know, for me, it's appropriate to dig into some of the issues of transplantation. Um, Great. So we'll, we'll, we'll do that next week. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you in advance. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Amaya. Have a good weekend, everybody. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Oh, there you are. I want to speak a moment at the end. David. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm going okay. out. I'm going to go right. Take care, everybody. Bye. Okay. Thanks, Amaya. Thanks, Amaya. <laughs>